Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar, Military Connected Students, Education Policy Update 2022. Uh, just for a few housekeeping rules, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, you will be able to get uh, information on where to find it uh, once it's been uploaded to our site. Uh, resources are available on, again, the MEC website after the event. And we want you to submit questions in the Q&A feature. And um, after the webinar, we'll be sending out a survey. And we really appreciate when folks fill that out because that lets us know where your interests lie and how um, we can approach those questions with great speakers. Next slide, please. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Sarah Appel. I am the Associate Director for Policy Initiatives at the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. And um, I'm very happy to have, uh, have you with us today. And next slide, please. And I want to introduce our presenter uh, is Will Hubbard, and he is the Vice President for Veterans and Military Policy at the Veterans Education Success. Will has had many years of experience with uh, education policy and those that affect military connected students. So Will, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna let you take it. Thanks so much, Sarah. And it's great to be here with everybody. Uh, I'll keep this as uh, informal and informative as possible. Um, if there are questions throughout, you're welcome to ask. I'm, I'm okay with pausing, things like that. Uh, you're also welcome to hold it to the end. Either way is fine with me. We're gonna do two things uh, really. And that's the first will be to look at the higher education uh, the Department of Higher Education, or I'm sorry, the Department of Education, Higher Education Negotiated Rulemaking. Uh, it's a mouthful. Um, and so we're going to look at that process, where things stand, uh, both tables. Uh, we'll go into the vernacular of that a bit. And then the second part, we'll look at legislative updates and also what's to come. So um, to kick things off, let's take a look at the rulemaking process. So what is NEGREG? For some of you, you might be familiar with the, of this process. For others, this might be completely brand new. Um, but NEGREG is essentially short for uh, regulatory negotiations or negotiated rulemaking. Um, some would say it's actually uh, REG NEG, not NEGREG. There's a bit of a debate over that. But whatever you call it, ultimately, it's the very unique process that the Department of Education uses to take the laws, the statute, the, the new rules on the uh, new issues on the books, and to turn those into rules on the books or regulations. Um, and there's really three things that. Uh, are combined into that process. The first is the statute, so that's the new law. That's the intent of Congress. It's what advocates and members of Congress and their staffs work together on. Then that is eventually turned into the regulations. Those regulations are what have the ultimate impact on students, but that in-between part is where NEGREG sits. It's a committee of individuals who represent various parts of higher education. And in theory, if everybody is represented at the table, and they come up with what's called consensus or everyone agrees on what they, the final rules look like, that consensus then drives the final rule for the department. If, however, there is not consensus reached, then it's up to the department to take the feedback and inputs and come up with their own final rule. Uh, it, you know, the key seat that we focus on, of course, is the service members and veterans seat. Um, this obviously color, uh, covers the entire military connected community to include families, survivors, um, and, and also children in some cases. Although that would be later, obviously, um, once they reach higher ed. So we'll go into some more detail about this process. The 2021-2022 rulemaking had two tables. Now a table is quite literally that. In, when we were in person times, it was a table of uh, individuals on a committee who would participate in the negotiations in person. And the table is essentially representative of a slate of issues. So those representatives come together, look at that set of issues, debate and negotiate them over a series of three meetings. Each of these meetings or rounds or sessions, call it whatever you want, uh, occurs over a, a full week. So a full five day working uh, period. And it, these are full days. Uh, in person, it's typically eight to four. Uh, online, they've given a little bit more flexibility, but still full days. And so there's a lot of debate to be had. Now, the current negotiations that are ongoing, we're actually in a series two or table two uh, of this process, i.e. the 2022 negotiations. And so uh, you can see a sample of the, the topics listed there, as well as the, the dates and the negotiators. The negotiators specifically for both table one and table two came from the service members and veterans community. 
You see in um, table one, you've got Justin Hawtrow from SBA. Many of you might know him. And then also Emily DeVito from VFW. She's a bit newer to the team, but both of them proved themselves to be absolute powerhouses in the negotiations. And then series two, you've got the negotiators, Travis Hoare from Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, and then Barmak Nasirian from our team, Veterans Education Success. Also, uh, those two have, have demonstrated to a just absolute stellar performance so far. So uh, one thing that I'll note is the, the, whatever the person, whatever the negotiator sitting at the table has to say on certain topics can carry either more or less weight depending on the perspective of that community. For example, 90-10 is a huge topic for service members and veterans. And so that typically carries uh, an over, overweighted uh, performance. So we'll get into some of the details about those topics if you'd like, but want to kind of give an overview of what the overall process looks like. Now, bear in mind as well that uh, table one and table two, though they're separate, they operate as far as the Department of Education is concerned, they operate in tandem because the department is focused on hitting certain deadlines and timelines based on the statutory requirements of when these um, negotiations will take place, result in proposed rules, and then also result in final rules. And that, that's quite an extended timeline. So the current administration kicked that off as soon as possible, basically right, right once they got into the White House. Um, that be, uh, begins with public hearings and then goes into the first table, a series of negotiations covering that list of topics. Then a second table, which we're in at present, uh, with the, the third and final of that series to happen in March. And then once they've gone through both of those tables, it's then up to the department staff to take all that feedback and information, again, assuming they don't reach consensus, and then they basically put together what the regulations are gonna look like. Then they propose that to the public one more time for, for comment. And then based on all the feedback that they received from the public, they then the following year, so approximately mid 2023, will publish what the final regulations look like. So you can see it's quite a timeline and requires a, a lot of input, a lot of feedback. Again, it's a very extended process, mainly to accommodate for the fact that there are so many stakeholders within higher education. So looking at um, the series one outcomes, make sure I'm on the right slide, yep. Um, so the series one outcomes, you know, it was strong. It was a strong outcome. Everybody felt that the student uh, perspective was really well heard and that uh, service members and veterans in particular had a, a very, very strong performance uh, that they significantly influenced the outcome of the, the, the overall table as well as the individual topics. And there was quite a bit of testimony actually from the veteran service organization community as well as the military service organization community. And that really changed the tone, I think, of the overall debate. In the past, we've seen some of these negotiations go, um, you know, not great, uh, a, a lot more, uh, I'd say energy at the table is probably a nice way to put it. Um, but we saw in the first table, it was very smooth. You know, of course, there were minor disagreements and, and academic discussions of debate and whatnot. But ultimately, we felt like we came out of that very strongly. Um, some key wins were on uh, the public service loan forgiveness, as well as uh, disability, um, closed school discharges, a lot, of, a lot to do with um, more the, uh, the front end, if you will, of higher education in terms of loans and things like that. And then the second series, which we're actually in now, so we can talk through both what the expectations were is how we're looking for it to, to turn out. We're, we're, we anticipated initially a very strong pushback from um, industry and specifically the for-profit education industry, uh, higher education uh, uh, schools, in particular representatives from these schools. And we feel like um, it's been a very even discussion so far um, and, and really for the better. So ultimately our interests are the students and the students' well-being, And so we feel like it's gone pretty good. Um, the third round, which comes up in March, you know, we will find out how it actually turns out. Um, but some of the key topics I mentioned earlier, including uh, 90, 10, you know, we're just waiting to see what the final language looks like. One thing to also note uh, throughout this process, which is somewhat unique, is when they're forming these regulations, they have what's called issue papers. These are essentially the, the foundation of the process. Now, issue papers, you can kind of think of as legislative proposals in a way, uh, or a, a draft bill. Those go through an iterative cycle. And so by round three, which we're about to go into for table two next month, um, we'll find out what the department, based on all that feedback, is proposing essentially as its final cut. 
this gives a really good indication of the direction of the regulations. Um, we felt like the department had very fair and strong papers to begin with. Uh, those were then debated throughout, including this past week with the second round of table two. And then in March with round three, we'll see kind of where the department is leaning. And so by that point, the, the debates and negotiations mostly focus on tweaking things, uh, adjusting minor nuances, um, but mostly things are, are, are settled at that point. Um, there are still a couple topics that remain unresolved, but by round three, we should have a better sense of where those stand. And so um, we're looking forward to seeing how it turns out. But keep in mind, once the department has all this feedback, it's then up to them to take it all, turn it into what they propose as the regulations, and then collect public input. So that would be a great chance for any of you to take, uh, take a look at those proposals and then provide comments. The department really takes these comments seriously because it helps them fine tune and shape. And so if that's something that anybody's interested in, certainly feel free to follow up and we'd love to talk more about that. Turning over to legislative updates. So um, there's quite a few bills that uh, came, came through this past year. I'm gonna talk to a few of them. And then there's actually one that I wanna highlight uh, that's still under discussion, so not yet passed, but we'll talk about it in a bit. And that's the College Transparency Act. So the first one I'd like to look at is the Remote Act. The Remote Act, as I'm sure many of you know, was the emergency extensions uh, or emergency extension of COVID provisions, specifically the housing piece in particular, uh, when everything moved to a online or digital format, though students were already receiving in-person housing costs. So since the national average is um, you know, about $800, which is in a lot of cases significantly less than what you get in person for housing costs, the big question was, if everybody's moving online, does everybody get the online rate? And how does that work? Now, if that switched overnight, that would be a drastic change for quite a few people. For example, if you live in an area that's more expensive, say San Francisco, New York, or Chicago, some of these more expensive cities uh, compared to let's say a rural area, then dropping that housing cost would have been a big problem. People literally overnight would have been, in some cases on the street. So there was an emergency bill, as I'm sure you all recall, that was passed that basically said, as you were getting a rate, we're keeping the rate. So no changes. Um, those provisions were extended several times, uh, largely because nobody knew how long the pandemic would last. Uh, obviously, it's still going on, so it's still a bit unclear how this is going to turn out. And the, the current package has been extended till June 1. Uh, but bear in mind that the Department of Veterans Affairs, Capitol Hill, and many others have expressed not, in it, uh, not having the intention of extending it further. They're both looking at what schools are doing, how they're reacting, how they've managed to mitigate COVID concerns and potentially gone back in person, uh, whether that's hybrid um, or in some other modality. And so we'll have to see where that, uh, you know, where that lands over the next couple of months, but certainly that's of uh, key interest. One thing that we'll talk about a little bit later is also taking those provisions and then uh, making them for future issues or emergencies. And so we'll look at that. Um, the next thing to look at is the NDA or the National Defense Reauthorization Act. And this bill, as I'm sure everybody knows, is a massive omnibus bill. You know, the, the DOD budget is nearly $700 billion annually, the largest uh, portion of the federal budget, of course. Um, and so that's, that's kind of ha happens as its own package, but is always a good opportunity to consider other things related to DOD and potentially influence certain areas uh, outside of DOD in some cases. So the current uh, bill had quite a few provisions, you know, it's nearly a thousand pages, um, but there's uh, about six provisions that really are probably our focus. I'll go ahead and read them off uh, verbatim. If anybody wants so, you know, follow up with me off offline to get a copy of this. Of course, I'm happy to share. Um, but Section 220 was the Defense uh, Research and Engineering Activities at Minority Institutions, basically DOD encouraging uh, their overall, or, well, Congress encouraging DOD to have uh, a lot of their departments and agencies work very closely with MSIs, more specifically around um, engaging in engineering activities, so, you know, st STEM type programs. Um, section 551 is the Troops to Teachers Program. Some of you might have heard that the Troops to teacher, Teachers Program was due to sunset, i.e. go away. 
and um, working with our colleagues over at the American Legion and others, uh, they had spearheaded this in particular, and uh, we were very supportive of that overall effort. And so they were able to re-engage the Troops to Teachers program, uh, making sure that it, in fact, did not sunset or go away, uh, finding a lot of great value in it. The next to consider is Section 557. This is the uh, United States Naval Community College. So I'm sure everybody's heard of the uh, CCF or the Community College of the Air Force. Well, the Navy is now doing their own program. Um, this will be a fully accredited uh, college and will also cover, in, in addition to the Department of the Navy, will cover uh, its uh, sister branch, the Marine Corps. Uh, and so that should be interesting to see how that shapes up. Next, uh, we've got Section 558. This is the codification of the United States Air Force Institute of Technology. Pretty much sums it up in the title, uh, but another interesting move happening in terms of DOD taking a, a deeper look at codifying where it stands in higher ed. Well, Section this is Sarah. Right, um, we've had a, a question through an email. Um, they wanted to know what's the difference between the Air Force Technical Institute from the Air Force Community College? You know, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have a good answer, but I could definitely uh, reach out to them and find out and we can chat offline. Um, I suspect that the focus is more on making sure uh, specific programs, particularly those in STEM and cyber, uh, are getting a greater interest. Um, but I'm not even necessarily sure if it's, let's say, uh, similar to how a typical university works. Maybe it's a, a college or department in that university. Um, so we, we could take a look at that and follow up. But All right. Thank topic. you so much. Yeah, absolutely. The next would be Section 559. This is the concurrent use of uh, Department of Defense tuition assistance and Montgomery GI Bill selected reserve benefits. So um, this is kind of an interesting one because in a lot of cases, if you're a reservist in particular and you're using MGIB select reserves or SR, um, you might have a challenge if you happen to be on, let's say some long-term orders, uh, if your MGIB select reserves is not covering full tuition. So this gives you the ability to use both at the same time. Previously that was barred. You were only allowed to use one or the other. And of course, you know, neither was really cutting, cutting it for many reservists. And so this provides more flexibility. Next, we've got section 559F, uh, and this is the report on the status of Army Tuition Assistance Program, uh, Army Ignite Ed Program. We will talk about this in more detail, but the bottom line is the Army Ignite Ed Program is not doing so great. And so uh, we'll talk about what happened, where, where that stands, and then what's to come. Uh, this specifically, though, is Congress asking that they get a report within 60 days from the passage. So that would be actually mid next week. So we'll talk through that. And then um, the other thing to note is for FY23 uh, NDAA, we're looking at things like base access issues uh, as well as quite a few others. So though many might not necessarily think of the NDAA as the go-to when it comes to legislation in terms of a vehicle, it's actually a great way to, to get a lot of stuff through since we know the NDA is going to pass. And so if you can get something in there and it stays, then it's got a good shot of going as well. Uh, looking next at the Parity Act, uh, that's- Well, uh, this is Sarah. Yeah. Before oh, you, ahead. I'm so sorry. I'm no, going to no, no, jump no. in real quick. Um, we uh, have an answer for the Air Force Institute of Technology versus oh, the go. community. Yeah. So Proud thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you, Thomas uh, Betcher. He says the Air Force Institute of Technology is a graduate school and provider of professional and continuing education for the United States Armed Forces and is part of the uh, United States Air Force. AFIT is a component of Air University and Air Education and Training Command. So thank you so much, Thomas. We appreciate you jumping in and uh, letting us know about that. Perfect, yeah, it's team effort. Um, That's that right. Um, so next, uh, unless there are any other questions, you know, we can jump to the, uh, the Parity Act. Uh, the Parity Act is, you know, that's short, short title, if you will, or sh shorthand, actually. Um, but the short, short title really focuses specifically on the, the Guard and Reserve. Um, and so in a lot of cases, uh, Guard and Reserve members were finding that they were ineligible for benefits uh, in, in the same case where they might be doing the same work as an active duty counterpart. And so uh, duty status became a, a big point of debate. Uh, especially when it came to benefits, in this case, specifically the, with the GI Bill. And so this bill hopes to address that in particular. Um, the idea is that if you serve a day in uniform, regardless of duty status, i.e. whether as a reservist, a guard member, um, or on active duty, 
that you still have that count towards your GI Bill uh, eligibility. And so this bill seeks to address that. Uh, we think it's a great thing overall, um, certainly expensive, and that was kind of the, uh, the main hurdle overall, but uh, ultimately it's, it's very, very positive, uh, and we think we'll pay dividends long run. Um, next, we've got the Army Ignite Ed. So we talked a bit about this earlier, and uh, the bottom line is the program is not doing well because the way that the Army chose to approach this is, I think some have seen um, in retrospect, not ideal. They shut down their platform that they were using for tuition assistance and running a lot of their uh, education programs through. Uh, so they shut that down before they turned on the new program. And then unfortunately, in between that, uh, as there was a gap, during that gap, they found that the new program would take much longer to come online than they had anticipated. So in theory, they, they should have maybe turned the old program on. I don't know, I'm not, not in the weeds on it. Um, but ultimately it left quite a few soldiers um, in the breeze. And had that if they were already taking programs, then they were trying to put the bill themselves, or in a lot of cases, the schools were being very generous and putting it on hold in terms of costs. Uh, but it's now getting to a point where it's very unclear where, where this is going to go. So this has two effects. Number one, obviously it damages the relationship between the institution of the army and also institutions of higher education. So that's problematic long term. But in addition to that, the practical impacts to soldiers means that they are now not looking to go use tuition assistance programs while they're on uh, active duty. This is problematic because then that actually means they end up eating into their GI Bill potentially or taking out loans even worse, um, or they put education on hold altogether, meaning by the time that they get out of the military, uh, oftentimes serving a four-year contract, then their GI Bill is gonna be more fully expended since they haven't had the chance to take advantage of tuition assistance. So um, no, no clear news where this stands, but as I mentioned earlier, the uh, report that ma Congress mandated within the NDA, um, we should know at some something by mid next week, if, if not uh, you know, even sooner. So information on this is imminent, but unfortunately in the meantime, it is definitely a problem. And certainly if there's feedback or concerns about this, you know, we'd love to hear that so we can continue the conversation with the, uh, the Army because it's a big problem. Looking next uh, is the, uh, at, at, uh, the College Transparency Act. So this isn't on the slide, this is a bit of a late ad, mainly because it's not complete yet, but I did want to flag it. Um, many of you are familiar broadly with the College Transparency Act, but the, the very simple goal is to get as much information about students' uh, outcomes, uh, success rates, things like that, and then deliver that to prospective students in a meaningful, understandable, and highly digestible way. Um, you know, that, that's really, really the bottom line. And so um, this has been hotly debated, mainly because of data sharing concerns, um, but ultimately prospective students would have a much easier time coming up with a final decision on where to go to school if they could look at all the information possible and really make an informed consumer decision. Uh, this is something, something that we've uh, strongly supported for a long time, and many others do, um, well, uh, literally hundreds of groups uh, have signed on to support this over the years. And so uh, this had come up more recently, specifically because it actually passed in the House as part of the Competes Act. Uh, and that was early in February, February 4th specifically. Um, once it passed the House, then it was unclear whether or not the Senate would take it up uh, whether they would do that quickly or what the timeline would be. And it seemed like it was gonna happen fast, uh, but right now, to the best of our knowledge, it's being discussed at the four corners level, i.e. The, the House and the Senate, both the Republicans and Democrats. So all four of those parties are at the table negotiating what this is ultimately gonna look like in the Senate. And once they come up with an agreement, it could either be hotlined, which just means there's essentially a holding period that if nobody objects, it passes automatically. Um, or could be a final vote. It's really unclear how this is gonna turn out, but ultimately something to keep an eye on. So I'll pause there, see if there's any questions and otherwise take a look at what is to come. All right, so next on the docket, um, the first thing that I'll flag is codifying protections. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but to go into a bit more detail, the idea here is to take the uh, COVID emergency protections um, and then extend those uh, indefinitely. 
Now that doesn't necessarily mean extend those indefinitely for this specific population, i.e. if you're uh, moving from a in-person to an online back and forth and back and forth that you can just change uh, at free will. That's not the case. But the idea is that uh, Congress would, in theory, would give uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs the authority that under emergency situations or um, challenges that come up, they would have the authority to grant those protections. So for example, if let's say in Texas, there happens to be a hurricane or something that significantly impacts students in Texas, VA would have the ability to uh, continue to grant housing allowance to those students if they've, let's say, moved to an online modality uh, without affecting their income. So that, that could be a big one uh, if that goes through. Certainly uh, of, of key interest to quite a few groups. Um, the next is uh, program approval. This is one that I've been working on personally very closely. And we talked about um, generally the concerns of, of what happens when schools close, uh, some of those issues associated with the negotiated rulemaking, you know, we see that the back end outcomes of that. But what we'd like to do is instead of constantly seeing the harms and then being reactive is try to capture the concerns on the front end to make sure that they don't exist. A little bit of proactivity in that sense. Um, I'll go through some of the key provisions of things that we're interested in with uh, a program approval bill specifically related to Title 38 GI, GI Bill funds. Um, and again, Think of it as gatekeeping. Who gets into the system moving forward? If only good schools are getting into the system, then that over time would hopefully shrink those schools that are not delivering great quality for students, um, or those schools that are not delivering great quality for students. And then over time, ideally, the pool is then uh, clean, solid schools that have good quality. So a couple of key things that we're looking at specifically is uh, first, making sure that GI Bill money goes to actual uh, education things such as act, academics, uh, instructional spending, you know, that's that's sort of that provision, um, but really things that contribute to the overall academic well-being and impact of a student. We've seen in some cases, unfortunately, where schools will set spend even as little as 5%, in some cases even less, of that, that tuition on real academics. That's very problematic. In a lot of cases, that money is then going to marketing to bring in additional students uh, something that we're very concerned about. The second thing that we're most interested in with this bill is schools uh, being approved for the program that have proven outcomes. So that's things like uh, strong student earnings, a low student debt ratio, co low co cohort default rates, um, strong repayment rates. Obviously, if they are doing well, getting good jobs, then they can repay well, um, strong graduation rates, and then uh, licensure passage rates. So all of these, and these are just illustrative um, not necessarily comprehensive, but these are examples of things that would provide the ability to measure a school uh, in a very specific, tangible way. And if if a school is failing on any one of these, is not you know that's not necessarily a, a strong flag or an indicator. But if they're failing on several of them, or even multiple, or even all of them, then certainly that that would give cause uh, for concern. And that would. Well, I'm so yes, sorry. Please. This is Sarah. We've got two questions in the queue on this topic. Yep. Um, the first one is. Um, how does college transparency uh, compare to the Department of Education college scorecard site? Um, so I, so you're asking if um, it would add additional metrics to uh, the scorecard or can you just clarify? Um, Andrew, if you'd be as kind as to uh, type in uh, what you're specifically looking for, we'll address that. Um, while Andrew's responding, um, we have another one about how will enforcement or compliance assurance be conducted? Great question. Um, so, you know, it depends on what pot of money you're talking about on uh, enforcement. That's that's a piece that I'll get to next. Um, but but broadly, if it's uh, Title IV money, so Higher Education Act uh, type funding, then uh, that's all, of course, run through the, the Department of Education. Uh, and there's, there's quite a few vehicles, actually, for them to do that. Um, one notable one is the enforcement unit, which had gone away under the previous administration and is now being brought back, which I think is a fantastic thing. Um, the current administration is really prioritizing accountability and enforcement. And so that, that's one, uh, one example. Uh, program participation agreements or PPAs is another vehicle that the Department of Education has to uh, have strong enforcement. It's a, an agreement between that school and the department to accept Title IV money. 
if they are not doing well or not following through on what they are expected to follow through on, then that could be a potential way that the department could act. They could pull their PPA and uh, they would no longer be allowed to receive federal funding through the Higher Education Act. So those are just a couple examples. Obviously staff at Department of Ed are terrific and work really hard and do everything they can to make sure schools are doing what they're supposed to be doing, delivering strong outcomes for students. So there's no shortage of ways that they could do that. Um, but I'll turn to the VA side for a minute, which actually lacks quite a few of those mechanisms. For example, there are not PPAs uh, in the same way that the Department of Education has. Uh, there is also not an enforcement unit in the same, um, I'd say classical or traditional sense uh, of the term. Uh, there is of course education services at Department of Ed, or I'm sorry, at VA, but they're not necessarily focused on uh, enforcement or accountability mechanisms though that is under the purview and they do on occasion take action, it's, it's not really what they focus their time and energy on. So that's a challenge. Um, one thing that also I'll point out that Department of Ed has that VA does not have is the ability to issue a requirement for a letter of credit. So if there's a school that's a bit risky financially, the Department of Education can ask the school to essentially put up collateral on the concern that if they fall apart, there should be something left. You know, we look, uh, saw, for example, with ITT Tech, when that collapsed, um, they had less than $100,000 in the bank. And uh, all of, I mean, it was a absolute house of cards, uh, despite taking in billions and billions of dollars over the decades from students, primarily through Title IV funds initially, but then, of course, also extensively with the GI Bill. So I know that's a long-winded answer, but there are quite a few enforcement mechanisms. Um, definitely heavier on the, the Department of Ed side than the VA side, but that's also something that we're looking at. I guess we'll right. go back to uh, Andrew if he's got some more details. He does, he does. Right. So Andrew's original question was, um, how does college transparency compare to the Department of Education College Scorecard site? And he specifically is asking, is there a difference? And if so, what are those differences based on the information already collected by the scorecard? Yeah, great question. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. Um, so there's a handful of other metrics, which I'm happy to uh, to go offline. I don't, I don't have them memorized, uh, but we can certainly follow up. Um, there's a handful of other metrics that they would focus on uh, in addition to everything that they already collect. And then there's a heavy emphasis on making sure that uh, all of this information is available to students, but more specifically uh, disaggregated by certain population. So for example, race, gender, background, socioeconomic status, uh, and a handful of other factors, you'd be able to essentially slice and dice the data in a way that would provide a much more meaningful view of uh, what those outcomes look like for you and your own personal background compared to the overall student population. And I'll just kind of give an example of how that might work on a more functional basis. So like, for example, right now, if you look at a school in terms of their graduation rate, that's, you know, that is an important uh, number to look at. It's an important metric, but it doesn't necessarily tell the full story. If you compare, for example, the overall graduation rate of an undergraduate population to, um, let's say, non-traditional students in an uh, uh, undergraduate population, those numbers might look significantly different. And if you're a working parent or a student veteran or somebody from a non-traditional background, it would be very helpful to have that information disaggregated for you. So not saying that you can or can't do that per se, but to be able to slice and dice it based on your background um, is something that the uh, CTA would heavily emphasize. And I think it would be overall a benefit for students. Thanks, Will. We've got one um, last question here, and I believe it's about um, Army Ignited. Uh, do schools have any options recourse with the Army in situations where that institution has not been paid for more than 12 months? And they're talking about spring, spring no. 2021 courses. Right. Yeah. Um, first off, that really sucks. I mean, I, I'll apologize on their behalf because you probably won't hear that from them. Um, the reality is there is very little recourse. Unfortunately, there are quite a few actions you can take. None of these actions are positive, um, specifically for the students, which is a challenge because uh, obviously schools, uh, good schools in particular, you care about your students and you want them to do well and succeed. And it does leave you with very little positive options to take. Um, one option could be to advise students to drop. I mean, that's, that nobody ever wants to be in that scenario. Uh, that's just not a good option, but none of these are. The second is to advise loans. Also not something that I would support. I uh, don't recommend that for any schools to advise students to do, but again, it's an option, but not a good one. 
Um, another thing that you could do is what, what I would personally recommend um, is just take it as a, a grace period for students. I mean, that's, that's tough to hear probably. I mean, this is, we're talking about a significant amount of money potentially um, that is tough to keep on the books as the scholarship money uh, essentially is what it, what it boils down to or in, institutional loans uh, at a 0% rate, things like that. Um, again, neither of those are good options for a school. So uh, you're left with unfortunately very few actions you can take. Now, in terms of the relationship with the army uh, specifically, Obviously, you can write to the Army, and I would encourage that, and I would encourage all schools to make their voices heard on this, uh, both with the challenges that, that it presents, as well as uh, potentially the lack of communication, which I've heard to be a significant problem across the board. Um, and you're also welcome to reach out to me with your own personal experience, because I try to uh, fairly regularly engage with uh, senior leaders at the Army, uh, specifically on this topic, as well as others. And so the more feedback that I have, I can continue to, to hammer that point home. So bottom line, there's not a lot of good options. And unfortunately, that's where things stand. Um, I, I wish I had better, better news for you all, but that's kind of where it's at right now. And we've got another question. Um, what will the reporting requirements reflect for schools? Uh, just veteran GI Bill or all military affiliated students? Um, uh, re regarding which program? Uh, is that related to CTA? Um, Dominic, could you uh, respond to that? And we'll get you a question. Uh, anonymous attendee said, um, follow up regarding Army TA, can we send the Army to collections? Ooh, um, I, I couldn't advise on that. Um, I can only kind of like, I can speak to some concerns that that might include. Um, so potentially a risk is you end up passing that on to the student. Um, what if the army is not willing to cover that cost and then they defer it to the student or the individual. So that could be potentially very risky. I don't know the specifics of how that would necessarily work from a financial aid perspective or um, you know, from the bursar's office on that. So I, I would not be able to advise on it, but um, I definitely caution potentially passing on that debt and specifically collections to the student. That would be that would be concerning. And Dominic responded, <clears throat> he said, any required reporting to the federal government or DOD agencies, Department of Ed, uh, this may impact what data schools collect on the student population. Uh, his original question is, what's the reporting requirements uh, and how will that reflect for schools uh, on um, the, the GI Bill or all military affiliated students? Yeah. So. This is a, certainly a point of concern for schools. Um, it affects students uh, less because they don't have to do the reporting, of course, um, although it has some downstream, downstream impacts. Potentially, schools are not happy with the, uh, the burden associated with reporting. You know, perhaps th that would affect behavior. But the bottom line is um, there are quite a few reporting requirements, um, certainly. And it's not necessarily the same across the board. Um, also, more challengingly, the Department of Education, Department of Defense, and Department of Veterans Affairs do not regularly talk about education topics and concerns, nor do they coordinate. So um, unfortunately, schools are in many cases left trying to understand the requirements that the diff different departments have and then figure out how they can report on them uh, appropriately. That's something that we ourselves are very concerned about um, because this leads to just terrible data overall um, unnecessary burden in a lot of cases when you have to report, let's say, the same same information, but in three different ways. Uh, that can certainly be very frustrating. So I hear you on that. Um, but if in terms of current requirements, uh, you know, there's quite a few. I would even hesitate to go th through the litany at this point. Um, but happy to, of course, talk offline if, if I could be helpful on that. And uh, we've got one more question that just popped in. Um, Regarding um, the Army Ignited, our school has not been paid in two years, even with three snow cases, two of which uh, were closed with no response. Uh, the third one was escalated, which probably will not uh, result in any action. Um, they're owed over $100,000. Oh. Um, so uh, she said the invoices are way over 30, uh, 30 days old which is um, unacceptable. Um, 
and then someone wrote uh, that if you're having trouble with Army Ignited, reach out through the Mighty Network Support Forums. Susan uh, Wilson um, has been very helpful to assist us with getting our information in the system. So we'll make sure that we put those notes um, when we wrap up the meeting uh, and part of the materials that you'll receive. So thank you for those thoughts. Again, yeah. if you have any questions, please use the question and answer uh, button at the bottom of your screen. And just two other quick comments on uh, the Armory piece, specifically with um, their programs. Um, you know, first, that's incredibly frustrating. <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's really all I, can, all I can say. I mean, if I were in y'all's shoes, that would drive me nuts. Um, and to be honest, I'm not even sure if I was in, in the uh, position of the school, I'm not sure what, what I would end up pursuing. Um, so that, that is a, a struggle. That's a, a, a real problem. Uh, I completely validate how difficult and frustrating that is. The second piece that I would say is uh, also make sure that your members of Congress are aware of these concerns because um, though they may be familiar with them or have heard of them, that doesn't mean that they necessarily know the scope or scale of the problem. If your school in particular, um, you know, any institution of higher learning in any district in America is a institution that will be taken seriously by their member of Congress. So I'd encourage uh, you to have either your president or provost or chancellor or all three or some combination thereof to write to your member of Congress outlining the real challenges associated with the, the downfall of this program in a lot of ways. Um, certainly focus on the, the impact and the scope and the scale, uh, focus on the, the, the detriment to students, um, really go into detail about that for members of Congress so they can understand not only how serious it is, but to try and do something about it. Uh, the, having the report in the NDA this past cycle was a good step in that direction, but to be honest, I don't think Congress is necessarily taking it as seriously as it should. And certainly the Army is, you know, I, I don't know, I can't speak for the Army, so I'm not going to try to, but they have a lot of work to do. All right. Um, well, uh, how are we doing on time with the rest of your slides? Um, I think that pretty much closes out. So. Okay, great. Um, because we have another question, uh, yeah, cool. which th thank you again uh, for all of your questions. We really appreciate it because it helps drive uh, the conversation and um, gets the information out there. Yeah. Uh, one of the comments, it says, can you comment on the Ed College Financing Plan 2022-2023? That now includes a section on VA education benefits. In most cases, schools have no knowledge of a prospective student's benefit status. How are colleges and universities to populate the section of the CFP to be in compliance with the Isaacson Rowe um, and Remote Act? Um, I'll have to look more into that. I, I don't have enough details on that to be able to speak to it uh, comprehensively, but I've made a note, so I'd love to follow up if, uh, if you can send me an email, but I'd love to talk further. Great. Thanks, Will. Also, you can see my, my info is there, so you're welcome to reach out anytime. Um, You've got my home number, which uh, I, was, I was joking with Sarah earlier, it is a rotary phone. Uh, it's my home line. So feel free to call at any time. Um, and then also my cell phone. Please don't text me. I don't text. Uh, I mean, I have a rotary phone for God's sake. So um, my email, of course, as well as I was open, um, feel free to reach out anytime, whether it's a small question or you're looking for some resources or you want to flag a concern. Uh, any and all of that is always welcome. So, Will, um, we have another question. Um, will a copy of the slides be provided uh, or available? Yes, uh, we are recording this session and um, the information uh, will be available to you, including the slides and the recording. So I'll look for that uh, after uh, they get posted to our website. And then we'll also send along a survey for you to complete. Again, just kind of giving us some ideas on um, what are some other topics that you would like to uh, hear more about. So, Will, what are some of the things that um, you might foresee, uh, I guess, coming up uh, that will uh, arrive to a decision quickly? Um, is it the 90-10 rule? We're going to see something closed on that. Is it going to be a, a change with the Army Ignited? Um, what, do you, what do you foresee with those? Well, um, so great question. Anything associated with rulemaking is, is probably not going to be, um, you know, relatively speaking, quick, given uh, all the steps in the process. Unfortunately, 
And fortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, there are statutory requirements of what that ultimately entails. So um, even if, let's say, everybody agrees that the 9 to 10 loophole should be closed and it's a terrible thing and it harms students and it's not good for schools to do and, and take advantage of, if everybody says, yep, we're totally on board, still it's, a, it's a, a lengthy process because the Department of Education, once they finish the negotiations, still has to solicit public feedback on the rules that they are proposing. Um, and then they take that feedback and then do final rules. And so that, that will likely be um, a 12 to 18 month process from, from today. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, depending on how you look at it, that could be relatively quick in the grand scheme of things. Um, quicker than that, you know, I would love to say the Army Ignited program, um, but that unfortunately at this point has been going on for um, about nine months and it doesn't appear that there's necessarily a clear way forward. So um, probably not quick as well. Um, I'm hoping the program appro approval bill goes quick. Uh, you know, that's one that I mentioned earlier that we're uh, focused on in particular. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm around this in the House uh, on in both parties. So um, I think it's gonna move relatively quick in the House, whether or not it moves quickly in the Senate, that's a different story. You know, we'll of course work with our colleagues there to try to make sure that gatekeeping is strong and that students have good options across the board. Um, that I would think is gonna go the fastest of all, all of the things that we talked about. And then of course, implementation of uh, the bills that had passed, irrespective of the Department of Education uh, affected statutory affectations, I suppose, uh, that will take um, a quicker process. You know, for example, anything that affects VA, they can do more expediently than let's say Department of Ed because they don't have to go through a public rulemaking. Uh, so that, that should be the quickest. Great, thank you. We've also got several questions here in the queue. Um, one of them is, uh, can you go over the changes regarding uh, the Guard Reserve members being able to use uh, different VA ed benefits at the same time? Um, yep, so uh, those are you know, two separate things to look at. Um, the Specifically, the, the Guard and Reserve uh, Parity Act focuses more on making sure that there's uh, equity between guard uh, reserve and active duty time. So for example, if you're doing the job in uniform, it should count toward, towards your GI Bill. Now, if you are a reservist, um, the stipulation in the NDA says that you're allowed to now use your Montgomery GI Bill Select Reserves or MGIBSR concurrently uh, or at the same time with your tuition assistance funds. So in the past that had been considered double dipping um, to use a turn of phrase, uh, but moving forward, there's a recognition that in most instances, if you're using your select reserve uh, MGIB, there's a pretty good chance that uh, it's not covering the full cost of tuition. And if you're also on, uh, let's say, active duty orders for a temporary period of time, you might have access to tuition assistance or through the reserves, you know, it depends on the situation. So to be able to use both at the same time certainly makes it uh makes going to higher going through higher education a, a financially much more viable situation for a student and is a great thing. Great, thank you. Um, we have back to the CFP. Do you know the status of the Department of Ed coming up with a shopping sheet template that is in compliance with IR and remote? Um, most of our waivers are you know, up in July. I'm just making a note. I don't know the status of that, but I can certainly uh, look to find out. Right. It's a good question. I mean, that, of course, it goes back to the original point of the importance of uh, interagency collaboration, which is something that we heavily push for because there, there is a lot of crossover. And unfortunately, not all the departments and agencies are talking. And so I think we've cut down on a lot of the a lot of the overhead. Um, unfortunately, we're just we're not quite there yet. So any feedback on that is always helpful. Thanks. Um... We have another one. Um, on top of that last question on the CFP, how are veteran services organizations working with higher ed organizations to understand these impacts of legislation and rulemaking changes from the school's perspective? Oftentimes our interests in higher ed align with our military connected students. Yeah, that's a, well, both a fabulous observation and also a great question. Um, so we, uh, I will say that we, uh, VES, we work very closely with the higher ed organizations. Um, and there's quite a few VSOs 
who um, are also very in very consistent conversation with many of them. Um, in particular, you know, not to call anyone uh, specifically out, but uh, VFW, American Legion, SVA, um, MOA, in that, you know, to not use acronyms, Veterans of Foreign Wars, uh, American Legion, of course, Student Veterans of America, and Military Officers Association of America. I would say those are probably the most engaged. Um, uh, certainly another one that's engaged in that topic is uh, TAPS with the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, that they've got a much more niche focus. And so, you know, really all of us operate uh, in a somewhat loose coalition, depending on the issue. Um, and and those the staff from, from those teams and I uh, and our teams, you know, we very closely coordinate and collaborate uh, across the board. And then I'd say of the post 9-11 era, certainly the, the most prominent one that y'all have uh, heard of is Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Um, and they actually uh, have a negotiator at the table too, which is Travis Horry, who's the primary negotiator. So they are, of course, a very uh, significant influencer in the overall process and topics. Um, I would say if, you know, reaching out to any of those groups is, is certainly a, a good approach. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me if you want to get connected to them or collaborate across the board. Again, many of our teams are in pretty regular conversation um, and also in regular conversation with the higher ed groups, uh, noting specifically that though we don't necessarily represent schools uh, and we represent the interests of students and we're very open about that, that focus, we certainly recognize the impact and importance of schools in the conversation. Because as an example, if there's a, a law or rule that we come up with that we think is gonna be great, but it's impossible to implement, then it doesn't necessarily have a great outcome. So that's where a lot of that feedback comes uh, significantly into play. And it's actually a major driver of the overall negotiated rulemaking process. Uh, it's schools, of course, have uh, many seats at the table representing different sectors, uh, as well as different sizes of institutions. So it's, it's an important voice at the table for sure. Great. Um, another one is um, any timeline on the Navy accreditation? Oh gosh, <laughs> I don't think so. Certainly not at this point. Um, okay. There's gonna be a lot that they have to work through. Um, and it's also, you know, in the uh, statute, they do codify specifically who is eligible for it. So I'd recommend taking a look at that language in particular. Um, but I think they have a lot of, a lot of work to do on that uh, and a long way to go. But it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that shapes up. You know, it's one that I'll be tracking personally very closely. Great. Um, and another one, DOD tuition assistance has been set at 250 per credit hour slash 4,000 annually for some time now. Will the yeah. TA amount be increased to reflect increases in college costs? Excellent uh, question, Dominic. And also, uh, Dominic, I've been following the conversation in the chat, and um, perhaps we might have uh, another webinar on what you're what you're doing at your institution um, with uh, the workload. So you and I can maybe chat offline and schedule something, and uh, you can share your your best practice at your institution. It uh, looks like a lot of people are interested. Uh, so again, please fill that out on your survey to let us know. And uh, again, Dominic, I'll reach out to you after the session and um, we'll uh, connect. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting topic. Um, you know, I could, I could speak uh, ad nauseum for that in particular, but um, to answer your question, most succinctly, no, no one is looking to increase that cost. It's probably not the answer you wanna hear, uh, which I acknowledge, but the, the reality is the Department of uh, Defense does not prioritize tuition assistance as one of its major programs. It's largely seen as kind of like a nice to have or, um, you know, like a like a bonus or an added benefit, but it's really not taken very, very seriously at the most senior levels, which is something that we would like to change. We think it's actually uh, potentially one of the most impactful components of the overall defense strategy, uh, particularly with the importance on cyber and STEM and having a more educated force mm -hmm. and the future of warfare. I mean, I could go again on and on and on about uh, the role that it has to play in national security, but the reality is it's really just really not seen that way within DOD overall, unfortunately. So I'd encourage you to help try and change that conversation. Uh, and then also looking at the second part of the question, you know, what can be done uh, in a more practical sense? I would say for the time being, assuming that it does not change in terms of overall cost per credit, I would still encourage schools to consider uh, taking it and seeing if they can find a way to make it work, primarily for the purpose of converting those students to GI Bill students. 
Uh, this is something that, you know, this is a practice that a lot, a lot of uh, more dubious schools have taken uh, very effectively so. And uh, unfortunately, I'd love to see, you know, them take advantage of it less and good schools take advantage of it more. So uh, the reality is if you do uh, eat the cost on TA, but do convert them to a GI Bill student, noting that there is no discount rate uh, associated with GI Bill, that can be a fairly effective long-term strategy uh, in terms of finances. So something I would definitely encourage uh, y'all to take a look at. And we'll, um, we'll take this last question before we wrap up. Um, someone has suggested that the Responsible Education Mitigating Options and Technical Extensions Act amended the Isaacson Rowe um, Veterans Health Care and Benefits Improvement Act of 2020. If the institution provides students with the U.S. Department of Education's college financing plan, it is not required to also provide the institutional disclosure requirements for student veterans under Section 1018 of Isaacson Rowe. Is this true? That's the first I'm hearing of that. Um, I'd have to take a look into it. It's, I mean, that would be concerning if that's the case. Um, so if you don't mind, just please follow up with me offline, uh, shoot me an email. I'd love to look more into that. Well, we'll um, we have lots of uh, good conversations and questions today. Um, any parting thoughts that you would like to share? Uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I love always presenting to this group um, for a multitude of reasons, not the least of which is I come from the Chicago land area myself. Uh, I grew up uh, downtown and then moved to uh, the suburbs for high school. So I have a bit of an affinity for the Midwest um, and certainly look forward to just hearing any and all feedback that everybody has. Um, obviously, it's, it's it, the, whole, the whole circle of life in, in higher ed is, is incredibly important. And though obviously I certainly focus more on students, um, your feedback is incredibly important. So I you know, can't continue to say that enough please, please, please reach out to me uh, with questions, input, ideas. Um, I would love to continue the conversation. And if I can be helpful in any way, that's really what I seek to be. Great. And again, if you would please uh, fill out that survey because we do share those results with Will. Um, and that will, um, again, help us all to get information um, to everyone uh, that has a need uh, in a special area and a focus. Awesome. So. Well, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Will. Thank you for joining us and uh, we wish you well. Thanks, Likewise. everyone.